Welcome back once again to Channel 514, where we will go ahead and finish our reading of Hesiod's Works and Days from the 1973 Penguin Classics translation by Dorothea Wender of Wheaton College, Massachusetts. So, just to recap some of the themes and elements in our poem that we've encountered so far, We've encountered some mythological content, like the story of Pandora's box and the story of the succession of races of men that lived on the earth before our own. So there was a golden and a silver and a heroic race, and finally one of iron, which is ourselves. And we're, we are, of course, the worst, and maybe we'll be the last. So. After that, what comes after that? Well, there is some sapiential content and some reflections on social and economic and political life. So Hesiod talks about different walks of life like farming and trade and the uh, pitfalls and problems of interacting with people above one's own uh, social class, and uh, he goes on to give uh, some more wisdom sayings about, well, about pride, about um, thrift, and uh, making a good use of one's resources, and storing up one's resources for the future, etc. So we go from the mythological to the sapiential, and then he gets uh, he gets down to singing of life in the agricultural world, so life on the farm, so to speak, and uh, the uh, the ups and downs of it, the ins and outs of it. So I stopped, actually, without realizing it. I stopped in mid-stanza last time, so I'm going to go back to the beginning of the stanza that I was on. And it begins, so, When the Pleiades, Atlas' daughters, start to rise, begin your harvest, plow when they go down. For forty days and nights they hide themselves, and as the year rolls round, appear again when you begin to sharpen sickle blades. This law holds on the plains and by the sea, and in the mountain valleys, fertile lands far from the swelling sea. To sow your seed, go naked, strip to plow and strip to reap, if you would harvest all Demeter's yield in season. Thus each crop will come in turn, and later you will not be found in need and forced to beg from other men and get no help. See now, you come to me like that, and I will neither give nor lend to you. You foolish Perses, go to work. The gods have given work to men. Don't let it be that you should take your children and your wife and beg with downcast spirit for your food from neighbors who refuse to care. You may succeed two times or three, but after that you will bother them in vain, and all your words will come to nothing, and your arguments will fail. I ask you, think about it this way, to banish hunger and to pay your debts. First, get a house, a woman, and an ox for plowing. Let the woman be a slave, unmarried, who can help you in the fields. Make ready in your house the things you'll need, so you won't have to try to borrow tools. And be refused, and do without, and let the ripe time pass and all your work be lost. Don't put off work until another day, or even till tomorrow. Lazy men who put things off always have unfilled barns. Constant attention makes the work go well. Idlers wrestle with ruin all their days. The sun's sharp fury and the drenching heat subside, and mighty Zeus sends autumn rain. Our bodies move more nimbly then, by day. Sirius passes overhead less time and travels more at night. The tree you cut at this time, when it sheds its leaves and stops sprouting, will be most free of wormholes. Now the time for cutting timber has arrived. Your grinding mortar should be three feet deep. Four and a half will make your pestle. Next, your axle should be seven. That will do. But with an eight-foot length, you'll have enough to make a mallet head for breaking clods. Your wagon wheels should be about two feet across to fit a wagon ten palms wide. 
The wood that is not straight can still be used for fuel. Bring a lot of it, and bring a curving plow beam when you come on one. Look for it on the farm or in the hills. The holm oak makes the strongest plow beam when one of Athena's craftsmen fits it to the stock and fastens on the pole. It's best to make two plows at home, for if one breaks, you'll have the other for your oxen. Elm or laurel make the soundest poles. The stock should be of oak, the beam of holm oak. Get two nine-year-old bull oxen. In their prime, they have full strength and work the best. Nor will they quarrel in the furrows, break the plow, and leave the work unfinished. After them should go a vigorous forty-year-old hand, who will dine upon a quartered eight-slice loaf, who will do his job and drive the furrows straight, who will keep his mind on work, not look around for friends the way a young man would. He'll sow with care, not wasting seed, lest stable men get flustered, dreaming of their social life. The crane, returning every year, cries out from the clouds above. And when you hear her voice, know that she means the time has come to plow, the time of chilly rains. She gnaws the hearts of men who have no oxen. Now's the time you'll need some bent-horned oxen of your own. Fattened at home, it's easy, then, to say, bring me my parent wagon. Easy, too, to turn a neighbor down. My oxen have their work to do. The man who's rich in mind alone believes his wagon's all but built. The fool. He doesn't know a hundred boards are needed for a wagon. Take some pains, and get beforehand everything you'll need. When plowing time arrives, make haste to plow, you and your slaves alike, on rainy days and dry ones, while the season lasts. At dawn, get to your fields, and one day they'll be full. Plow, too, in springtime. If you turn the earth in summer, you won't regret the work. Sow fallow soil while it is still quite light. Remember, fallow land defends us all, and lulls our children with security. Make prayers to Zeus, the farmer's god, and to holy Demeter for her sacred grain, to make it ripe and heavy when you start to plow, and hold the handles in your hand. And strike the oxen as they tug the straps. A slave should follow after, with a stick to hide the seeds and disappoint the birds. Good habits are man's finest friend, and bad are his worst enemy. If you proceed as I've described, your corn will nod and bow with fatness to the ground. If Zeus himself gives, finally, a happy issue, then you'll sweep the cobwebs from your storage jars, and you'll be glad, I think, to have your food stored up to draw on. Till pale spring arrives, you'll have your fill, not stare at other men, but other men will come to you in need. But if you put off plowing till the sun has reached his winter turning point, you'll reap sitting, and grasp your little crop, and bind in dusty haste, and unrejoicing, haul your harvest in a basket. Few will cheer. But Zeus, who holds the aegis, has a mind unknowable for men, and changeable. And though you've plowed too late, this cure may come, when first the cuckoo calls among the oaks, and pleases men over the boundless earth, if, from the third day, Zeus sends constant rain until the water rises to a point no higher than an ox's hoof, but not much lower, then the farmer who plowed late may rival him who did the job on time. Keep all these things in mind. Anticipate gray springtime and the rainy time of year. Pass by the blacksmith's busy shop, the crowd of gossipers in winter, when the cold keeps men from work, for then a busy man can benefit his house. Do not be caught helpless and poor in cruel winter time rubbing your swollen feet with scrawny hands. The idle man who lives on empty hope and has no way to earn his living turns his mind to crime. Hope is not good for him who sits and gossips when he has no job. When summer still is waxing, tell your slaves, summer is not forever. Now build barns. Defend yourself against the evil days Lenion brings, all of them days which pierce the hides of oxen. Guard against the frosts that kill when Boreas blows on the earth. He blows through Thrace where horses graze. He blows on the broad sea and whips it up. The earth and forest mutter. In the mountain pass he falls on high-leafed oaks and thick-branched pines and brings them to the fruitful earth, while all the boundless forests cry. The animals shudder with tails between their legs. They find no help in furry hides. The cold goes through even the shaggy-breasted. Boreas goes through an ox's hide, through the fine coat the goat wears, but his windy force cannot pierce through the thick-piled fleece of sheep. He makes the old man bend, round-shouldered as a wheel. 
He does not pierce the soft-skinned girl who stays indoors at home with mother, innocent of golden Aphrodite's works. She bathes her tender skin, anoints herself with oil, and going to an inner room at home, she takes a nap upon a winter day, when in his fireless house and dismal place, the boneless one is gnawing on his foot. For him, the sun no longer lights the way to better feeding grounds. The sun has gone to make his circuit with the dark-skinned men. He shines upon the Greeks a shorter time. The horned and hornless creatures of the wood, in pain, with chattering teeth, flee through the brush, one care in all their minds, to find a cave or thickly covered shelter, like the man, three-legged with his staff, with shattered spine, whose head looks to the ground, like him they go wandering, looking for shelter from the snow. Then put your body in a shelter too, a fleecy coat and tunic to the ground, woven with thicker woof than warp. Do this so that your body's hair lies still and does not shudder and stand up all over. Next, bind on your feet the fitted oxhide boots, lined with thick felt, and when the chilly time approaches, stitch the hides of newborn kids with sinews from an ox into a cape to keep the rain from falling on your back. A fitted cap of felt upon your head keeps your ears dry. When Boreas attacks, the dawn is cold. From starry heaven at dawn, a fruitful mist is spread upon the earth, upon the lucky fields. The mist is drawn from ever-flowing rivers. Stormy winds force it up high above the earth. Sometimes it falls as rain at evening. Other times it turns to wind when Thracian Boreas stirs up the thick-massed clouds. Finish your work. Get home ahead of him, so you will not be swallowed up in that black cloud from heaven, and come home dripping with your clothing soaked. Be on your guard. This is the hardest month. Stormy, hard on the stock, and hard on men. Your oxen should have half their usual fare. Your man, however, should have more. The nights are echoing and long. Take care to do all this until the year comes to an end, and days are equal to the nights, and earth, mother of all, brings forth her various fruits. When sixty days of winter have gone by after the solstice, then Arcturus leaves the holy stream of ocean, blazing forth first in the twilight. After him appears to men Pandion's high-voiced, mournful child, the swallow, when the spring has just begun. You'd better prune your vines before she comes, but when the one whose house is on his back climbs up the stems to flee the Pleiades, stop digging vineyards, sharpen your sickles, rouse your slaves, and stay away from shady nooks, and sleeping late till dawn at harvest time when the sun burns the skin. Then hurry up, and rising early, gather in your fruits, secure your food supply, for dawn will cut your labor by a third, dawn who assists you traveling and working, dawn who shows the road to men and helps at yoking time. But when the thistle blooms, and on the tree the loud cicada sits and pours his song, shrill and continuous, beneath his wings, exhausting summer time has come. The goats are very fat, and wine is very good. Women are full of lust, but men are weak their heads and limbs drained dry by Sirius, their skin parched from the heat. But at this time I love a shady rock, and Bibline wine, a cake of cheese, and goat's milk, and some meat of heifers pastured in the woods, uncalved of first or firstborn kids. Then may I sit in shade, and drink the shining wine, and eat my fill, and turn my face to meet the fresh west wind, and pour three times an offering from the spring which always flows, unmuddied, streaming down, and make my fourth libation one of wine. When great Orion rises, set your slaves to winnowing Demeter's holy grain upon the windy, well-worn threshing floor, then store it measured in the jars, when all your year's supplies are stowed away, Indoors, let go the hired man, hire a childless girl, the ones with nursing infants are no good. Your sharp-toothed dog should be well cared for, too, and feed him well, or he who sleeps by day will one day snatch away your property. See to your oxen and your mules, bring in sufficient hay and litter for their stalls, then give your slaves a rest, unyoke your team. But when Orion and the dog star move into the mid-sky, and Arcturus sees the rosy-fingered dawn, then, Perses, pluck the clustered grapes and bring your harvest home. Expose them to the sun ten days and nights, then shadow them for five, and on the sixth pour into jars glad Dionysus' gift. But when the Pleiades and Hyades and great Orion sink, the time has come to plow, and, fittingly, the old year dies.
But if your heart is captured by desire for stormy seamanship, this time is worst. Gales of all winds rage when the Pleiades, pursued by violent Orion, plunge into the clouded sea. Then keep your ships no longer on the wine-bright sea, but stay and work the land as I have counseled you. Protect your ship on land with close-packed stones to shield it from the mighty wind's wet blast. Unplug the bilge to keep Zeus and his rain from rotting it, and then stow all your gear and tackle in the house, and carefully fold up the wings of the sea-going ship, and hang the well-made rudder over smoke. Yourself, wait till the sailing season comes, then drag your fast ship to the sea, and get a cargo suited to it, which might bring a prophet home, just as our father did, O foolish Perses, sailing in a ship because he longed for great prosperity. Once, long ago, he crossed far overseas in his black ship, and came here to this place, and left Aeolian Cume far behind. He did not flee from riches or success, but evil poverty, which comes from Zeus. He settled in a wretched village, near to Helicon, the town of Ascra, harsh in winter, miserable in summer time, not really good at any time of year. But, Perses, keep in mind that all works have their proper seasons, sailing most of all. Admire small ships, but put your cargo in a big one, for a larger cargo brings a larger profit if the storms hold off. If you should turn your foolish mind to trade, longing to flee from debts and painful want, I'll teach the measures of the sounding sea, unlearned though I am in seafaring and ships, for I have sailed upon the sea just to Obia, once, from Aulis, where there gathered the Achaeans long ago, from holy Hellas, waiting out the storm, so they might sail with many men to Troy, land of fair women. As for me, I crossed to Chalkis, to wise Amphidamas games. The great-souled hero's children had arranged for many contests, advertised abroad, and there, I say, I conquered with a song, and carried home a two-eared tripod, which I set up for the muses in that place on Helicon, the place where I embarked on lovely singing, first at their command. And such is my experience of ships with all their nails, but even so, I can tell you the will of Aegis-bearing Zeus, for I have inspiration in my songs, because the muses taught me how to sing. The time for men to sail is fifty days after the solstice, when the exhausting heat of summertime is over. Then your ship will not be shattered nor your sailors lost at sea unless the shaker of the earth Poseidon sets his mind, or Zeus the king of the immortals wishes to destroy, for good results and bad are in their hands. At this time the winds are ready, are steady, and the sea untroublesome. So trust the winds, and drag your swift ship to the sea with confidence. Load all your cargo in, make haste to sail, and come back home as soon as possible. Don't wait for the new wine, the autumn rain, oncoming storms, and Nodos's awful blasts. He stirs the waves, and with him comes much rain from Zeus at fruit time, and the sea is rough. Men sail in springtime also, when a man can first see leaves upon the very tops of fig trees, tiny as the prince the crow makes with her foot. The sea is passable. This is spring sailing time, but as for me, I will not praise it, and it does not please my heart. I think this sailing time is seized too hastily, and you might find it hard to get away from trouble. Men do this unwisely, wretched men, for whom the breath of life is money. Yet to die at sea among the waves is terrible. But think, I ask, consider what I say. Do not put all your fortune into hollow ships, leave most of it behind, and load on board a smaller share, for it is terrible to meet catastrophe among the waves at sea, and terrible to load too great a weight upon your wagon, and to break an axle and have all your cargo lost. Preserve a sense of right proportion, for fitness is all important, in all things. Bring home a wife when you are ripe for it, when you are thirty, not much more nor less. That is the proper age for marrying. Your wife should have matured four years before, and marry in the fifth year. She should be a virgin. You must teach her sober ways. Particularly good is one who lives nearby. But look around you carefully, lest all the neighbors chuckle at your choice. No prize is better than a worthy wife. A bad one makes you shiver with the cold. The greedy wife will roast her man alive without the aid of fire. And though he is quite tough, she'll bring him to a raw old age. Beware of angering the blessed gods. 
your friend should not be treated just the same as you would treat your brother. Nonetheless, if you have such a friend, you must not be the one to start a quarrel, nor to lie for the sake of talk. But if he wrongs you first, with some disloyal word or act, you must be sure to pay him double for the wrong. But if he wants to be your friend again, and says he'll recompense you, take him back. A man who goes from friend to friend is vile, but let your mind be open as your face. Don't be called too hospitable, nor yet unfriendly. Don't be talked of as too fond of lower-class companions, or as one who likes to pick a fight with noblemen. Never reproach a man for poverty which eats the heart out and destroys, for it is given by the blessed, deathless gods. A man's best treasure is a thrifty tongue, his most appealing gift, a tongue that moves with moderation. For if you should speak slander, you'll soon hear worse about yourself. Do not be rude at crowded common feasts where all the guests contribute, for the cost is little and the pleasure very great. Never omit to wash your hands before you pour to Zeus and to the other gods the morning offering of sparkling wine. They will not hear your prayers, but spit them back. Do not make water standing toward the sun, unless he has not risen or has set. And when you travel, do not urinate upon the road or near it, and do not expose your body, for the night belongs to the blessed gods. A man who is reverent and knows much wisdom sits or goes beside a courtyard wall where he will not be seen. Do not lie down beside the fire when you have just made love and show your naked parts. Also, it is unwise to sow your seed when you have just come from a funeral. Far more auspiciously, beget your child after a feast of the immortal gods. Never pass through on foot a lovely brook of ever-flowing water till you pray and look into the beauty of the stream and in her clean, sweet water wash your hands. For if you cross a river with your hands and crimes uncleansed, the gods will punish you, and bring you countless pains in future times. At the gods' abundant feast, do not cut off with shining iron from the five-branched plant the dried-up shoots from those which still grow live. Never, when drinking, leave the ladle in the mixing bowl. That brings a fatal jinx. Don't leave a house half-built, for then a crow croaking might sit on it and caw bad luck. A pot unblessed by sacrifice brings harm. Don't ever eat or wash from such a pot. Don't let a boy of twelve years or twelve months sit on a tomb or other sacred thing. It will unman the baby or the boy. Nor should a man use water for his bath with which a woman bathed herself before. The punishment is awful for a time. If you should come upon a sacrifice still burning, do not scoff at things unknown. This too enrages God. Don't urinate in springs or in the mouths of streams which flow seaward. This is important to avoid, and please do not relieve yourself in them. Follow all this. Avoid men's gossip, which is wicked. Gossip is not hard to raise. Then she is light, but burdensome to bear, and hard to unload when you must carry her. Gossip is hard to kill when many men support her. She is rather like a god. Observe the days which come from Zeus. Instruct your slaves to honor them appropriately. The thirtieth of every month is best to deal out food and oversee the work. Men who have judgment know the truth of this. These days are sent by Zeus the Counselor. The following are holy days. The first, the fourth, the seventh. Leto on that day brought forth Apollo of the Golden Sword. The eighth and ninth of the waxing month are good for men to do their work, and very fine are the eleventh and the twelfth. Those days are good for shearing sheep and picking fruit. But more outstanding is the twelfth, for then the spider floats on air and spins her web in daylight, and the knowing one collects her stores. Upon that day a woman should set up her loom and push her work ahead. Avoid the thirteenth of the waxing month for sowing. It is best for setting plants. So we're coming to the end now, just a few more stanzas. Plants do not prosper on the mid-month 6th, but it's a lucky birthday for a male, unfavorable for girls, either for birth or marriage. Again. The first sixth of the month is not auspicious for the birth of girls, but favorable for gelding kids and sheep, and building sheepfolds, and for bearing boys. But such a boy will cherish stinging words.
secrets and lies and flattery and secret talk, geld boars and bawling bulls upon the eighth. The twelfth is better for the laboring mules. And that's bawling bulls, B-A-W-L-A-N-G. Yeah, I stopped to um, point that out. Uh, yeah, in full day on the twentieth, wise men are born with great intelligence of mind. The tenth is excellent for bearing males. The mid-month, fourth, for females. On that day, sheep may be trained to bear the touch of hens and shuffling oxen and the sharp-toothed dogs and laboring mules. But in the waxing month and in the waning, on the fourth, beware of heart-consuming worries. On the fourth, bring home a bride, but let the omens be most favorable for marrying that day. Fifty days are harsh and frightening. Take care. They say that, oh, fifth days, excuse me, are harsh and frightening. Take care. They say that on a fifth, the Furies helped Strife to bring forth dread Horkos, whom she bore to bring a punishment to the perjurers. The mid-month, seventh, is the day to cast Demeter's holy grain, most carefully, out on the well-worn threshing floor, and let the carpenter cut lumber for a house, and all the wood that's needed for a ship. Start building narrow ships upon the fourth. The mid-month ninth improves toward evening, but the first ninth is a wholly painless day, good to beget both sons and daughters, good to be born for both, and never wholly bad. The twenty-seventh of the month is best, as few men know, for opening a cask, or putting yokes on oxen, or on mules, or speedy horses, or to haul swift ships with many benches to the wine-bright sea, and few address this day by her right name. Broach casks upon the fourth, a holy day above all others is the mid-month fourth. Again, few know the twenty-first is best at dawn, and worsens toward the evening time. These days are blessing to the blessings to the men on earth. The rest are fickle, bland, and bring no luck. Every one has his favorite days, but few have knowledge that is sure. Sometimes a day will be a stepmother, and then she'll change and be a mother. He is truly blessed and rich who knows these things and does his work. Guiltless before the gods, and scrupulous, observing omens, and avoiding wrong. So it ends. So, that was almost a half hour. Well, uh, so yeah, that's works and days. And let's see if there's anything else, uh, anything else that I wanted to point out. Well, um, I don't really think so. I mean, there's, a uh, there's a lot in this that's, um, consistent with themes and elements and attitudes and uh, insights in some cases that we've already pointed out in uh, our videos on Theogony and in the uh, previous video before I um, started reading uh, as I was introducing the poem. So, um, yeah. I guess that's enough for now, and uh, if I come up with anything more, or think of anything more, then um, I'll just uh, I'll post that when I think of it, or I'll maybe put it in the, um, the, uh, the text uh, underneath the video, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, that's... Um, that's Works and Days, and thank you very much uh, for joining me on this, and next time I uh, sit down and do this, um, I'll either, um, well, anyway, I have some ideas for some more videos that I want to make sometime in the in the near future. So anyway, I'm sorry to uh, ramble on like that. So thanks again very much for joining me on this reading, and um, I will uh, be seeing you, so thanks uh, very much once again, and take care.